As always, this episode is sponsored by my go-to stop for everything makeup, Revlon. Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to the dynamic Kathy Ireland. When Kathy burst onto the modeling scene in the 80s, she quickly became a household name. She launched Kathy Ireland Worldwide in 1993. The company is now worth billions and has been named the 25th most powerful brand in the world by Licensed Global Magazine. And if you ask Kathy, she's just getting started. Thank you so much for being here, Kathy. Aww. You have been like an incredible inspiration for me. There's just something about who you are as a person, just in general. And then it's the businesswoman, the the model, the the activist. But you as a person, you just are so infectious. And I'm just so Aww. happy to actually know you. And thank you for being on Pretty Big Deal today. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for inviting <laughs> me. I'm, yes. I'm really excited to be here. Congratulations on your new show. Congratulations. Congratulations Thanks. on this show. Thank you. And your marriage and your baby. Oh, thank I'm you. I'm so happy for thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you're a successful model. You have created a brand that is worth billions. I want to get into all of that, but I also just want to know, like, how did it start? Because first you were scouted as a model, correct? Mm -hmm. how, yes. Where were you scouted? So I was, I grew up in Santa Barbara, California, and I was a beach rat. I mean, not I just not model material. Modeling yeah. school opened up in our town, and my parents had saved up money, and they said, "You know what? We saved up. We never did lessons when you were little. There's this new modeling school. Scout comes, and everyone was as shocked as I was when they asked if I wanted to go to New York for the summer because I just my clothes never matched, frizzy hair, peeling nose, one eyebrow." But <laughs> <laughs> the look of the moment was changing. Right. <laughs> and so I and I said thank you but no thank you. Really? Because, well, I I knew we couldn't afford for me to go. Oh. Okay. And it didn't sound like fun. Mm. I always had jobs and so to spend my summer in New York it just didn't sound like fun. And Anyway, the agency said they'd advance me the money and I I thought if I didn't give it a chance I might regret it. And amazing lessons. Did you move right. to New York City young? I went to New York City when I was 17 okay, for yeah. the first time. It's, that was young. It was young. It was eye-opening. Yeah, and then when, really did, when was your first SI Sports Illustrated um, experience? That wasn't until a couple of years later. I was probably about 20. Okay, got yeah. it. I was going to say, like, you're in 13 consecutive Sports Illustrated swimsuit issues. You had three covers. How old were you when you had your first cover? I was 25 because I just busted my knee skiing. Oh my God. And I just got the cast off and my leg was kind of atrophied. So my poses were kind of limited. <laughs> oh my gosh. Isn't that crazy? crazy it's just yeah. crazy to think like how back in the day, the models were always told like the younger, the better, the prettier. Right. But here you are 25 give, getting an SI cover. Exactly. Did you feel older than well, all the other the, girls? In the modeling industry, especially back then, you were made to feel like you were out to pasture at yeah. 25. I mean, it was crazy. And thank you for being such an inspiration of authentic beauty. Aww. I love that. And it was a crazy time, though. My eyes were open. I thought all adults were good people like my mom and dad. And I met some wonderful people. I met some really sketchy people, too. Yeah. I have a, my first fiction coming out in January. Really? It's called Fashion Jungle. And I never really intended to share these stories. It's fiction yeah. and it's based on true stories that I experienced, roommates experienced, really exposing a lot of just like the underbelly of things that go on. I, I mean, I'm sure you get it too. A lot of young girls like, you know, I want to be a model. What do I do? I feel like I'm just always giving them caution. You yeah. know, go with your eyes wide open. You need to look out for this and this. Be discerning and, you know, what to watch out for. Of course. Because uh, there are predators out there. What inspired you to write the book? I met an amazing woman, Rachel Van Dyken. She's a number one New York Times bestseller. And we got to talking and it's like, she's like, I could tell this story. It's like, 
uh, all right, let's let's do it. Let's collaborate and do it. It just felt like it was a story that needed to be shared, that there are so many, particularly young girls. When I was starting in the 80s, I mean, 14-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls, when uh, things went on, I went and told the agency. And nobody Today, did anything. Not much. It's frightening. I mean, today I would have called the police because I recognize that these are children. Wow. And it's not consensual sex when you're talking about children. It's, um, it's rape. It is and rape. It's, I mean, I saw so many young girls really hurt by this. How do you it feel just, about the Me Too movement coming out now? I, it's necessary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really important. And I do believe that any time there's an accusation, there is always a predator and there is always a victim. Yes. We don't always know who's who. Right. The truth has to come out. Yeah. Gotta get the facts and the truth. Yeah. But I'm grateful that people are, are standing firm and something that I share Finally. with young people. Figure out your values, have convictions for them, put boundaries in place, they're going to be challenged. Yeah. Because they will be challenged. They will, yeah. They really will be. I'm, I'm so excited to read that book. I think it's going to be really important. Oh, thank you. Here you are. You're an SI cover model, and but you've always had business on the brain. What was your first step into business be, besides modeling? I was four years old, sold rocks, painted <laughs> rocks for my wagon that I painted. Aww. I was the pesky neighborhood kid who was always going door to door. I had a paper <laughs> out when I was 11. Oh my goodness. And that was my first real serious job. I had it for three and a half years. And there weren't girls who were having routes when I did it. I, <laughs> my dad shows me an ad when I was old enough. It's like, are you the boy for the job? And I wrote to the editor, I'm not the boy, I'm the girl. And I can do it as well as any boy. Oh my and gosh. Uh, it, was, it was many great lessons, many, many great lessons. So selling rocks, mm -hmm. Sports Illustrated cover model, traveling the world as a model. But like, what was that, that moment where you said, okay, this isn't going to last forever. I want to go bigger. I want to go better. I want to make my mark here. When I first started modeling, the idea was that I could save money for college or to start a business. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust that it would be long lasting. And the entire time I worked in that industry, I was trying and failing at businesses. Mm. And just a lot of lessons. And I look at Failure is education in that respect. Yeah. I'm very well educated. What are some of those businesses that you started? Well, one of the businesses I started was um, beer. Oh. So I'm a really bad cook. <laughs> a friend gave me a book on how to make beer. And like the first batch I made turned out really good. <laughs> and I quickly saw how profitable it was. The profit margins were amazing. Second batch tasted like a science project. So it's like, okay, <laughs> I was a little humbling. I'm going to need some help. I spent two years, invested money, and basically came to the conclusion, I, I need more help than I think. I'm really not that good. I mean, I thought I was going to put all the brewers out of business. This is great. <laughs> 1980s. Good, so you're I, confident. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I humbled a lot and partnered with some guys in a microbrewery. And I quickly learned I didn't have a passion for it. Mm. I, I liked the profit margins, but the, the beer was okay, but I wasn't passionate about it. I wasn't willing to fight for it. Right. And you need, days will be hard in business. And so you've got to have passion and conviction. Beer didn't work out. Some other businesses didn't work out. What kept you going? Because after you get rejected time and time again, especially being in the modeling industry, and we understand what rejection is, what kept you motivated? What you said about rejection as a model, I'm, that is, I think, one of the biggest gifts mm. of that career because... Interesting. I, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not fun at the time, but when doors would slam in our faces, when people would hang up on me, and, and it still happens, I tell our team, if we're not getting rejected regularly, we're not trying hard enough. We're not pushing hard enough. When someone would reject me, I would just say okay, I'll come back tomorrow. I mean, maybe your circumstances will have changed. Maybe you won't be in power any longer, or maybe you'll be in a better mood. <laughs> and, and I encourage people, it's because women particularly will come to me and tell me about an idea, and I'll follow up with them. How is it going? Oh, well, you know, my boyfriend said it was a stupid idea, or somebody, you know, rejected me. They said, no, they're not going to carry my goods. And it's like, and that stopped you? Go back. I mean, maybe not every day. I was a little stocky, but maybe six months, <laughs> put it in your calendar and go back if you believe in it. And also to learn. I think criticism 
is a gift that we don't always appreciate. And mm. sometimes it can come in a really nasty package. I've had critics publicly say some pretty unkind things. Ugh. You know, as a model, the job description basically shut up and pose. Yep. I had a rare occasion to speak and a critic said I had a voice that could kill small animals. And my voice was so high and squeaky. And I realized, you know what, as mean as that was, he was right. What? I was 25 and I couldn't order a pizza on the phone. It was like, can I get a pizza? <laughs> they want to talk to, can we talk to your mom or oh your my daddy? God. <laughs> it's just like, okay, I have some work to do. So criticism can be, we have to listen to it and discern, is there any truth? Can I learn from it? Is my approach not good? Or is my product or services, how can I improve? Or is it just garbage that needs to be thrown away? It sounds like you had like a thick skin. Like you just immediately figured out how to get a thick skin and then kind of learn from what people gave you and then put it out into the world? I think so. I mean, just lessons along the way. I've learned to not let someone else's opinion of me or my circumstances define or destroy me. And, and that's not to let anybody put me in a box because so people important. like to do that too. It's so important yeah. for young people today to understand that, I think. Right, right. young today with social media yes. and just, you, you have to be really strong. Yeah, you really do. And you you also defend yourself in a great way. And I heard a story about how you were fighting back against a photographer. You started swinging. You know, I'm not a violent person, <laughs> but we got to have those boundaries. Yes. If somebody crosses that line, so... What it, happened? It was in the 80s and it was in Paris. And this magazine was doing a story on like new young American models. Okay. He wanted me to take my top off. Oh. And I said, no, you know, no, thank you. And he was really pushy. He wasn't like taking no for an answer. And I thought that was so strange. I was like, you could hire somebody else to do this. It's okay. Yeah, I don't um, need this job. And I think one of the gifts of working as a child, I always knew I could do anything for a living. I didn't feel like you know, desperate to have to do mm -hmm. that. I could do anything. You mm -hmm. know, my mom, she had housekeeping business, babysitting business, so like anything I could do. And he just was not taking my no seriously. And he started to push me into the bathroom to change. And so I just, you know, instinctively just, you know, just gave him a pushback and, and left. <sighs> Good but, for you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You gotta know your boundaries. You have to know you your boundaries, know. but also like, that's really cool, especially in that time and that era to fight back because there's a lot of girls who would be like, okay, well, this is all I've got. And you go, you take your top off and then you regret it right. the next day. Right. It's my, my hope and prayer for, for girls and boys out there in the industry to figure out your own boundaries. And I wasn't passing judgment on others. There were girls I worked with who grew up in, in places like the south of France where it wasn't a big deal. Right. And I grew up on the beach in Santa Barbara. And so some people would think, you know, swimsuits, you know, but it, for me, it wasn't like a hoochie thing. It was a uniform. Right. It was right. just, you get arrested if you're topless. Right. And so I had my boundaries and... You're an incredible model, but business woman extraordinaire. And Forbes has this amazing quote, Kathy Ireland is a CEO that happened to model, not the other way around. And I want you just to take me back to that early vision of Kathy Ireland worldwide. I love business and being a woman, being a mom, it's empowering because I, I always knew that I wanted to be a mom. Oh. I wanted to be Maybe I'm a bit of a control freak. I prefer to think of it as passionate. But having control of my calendar and my schedule, mm. the conditions under which our team works, whether it's our core team, the, the people in the factories, everybody involved. So really being able to assure that it has integrity mm -hmm. every step of the way. So that that's always been a dream. And we started, I was a pregnant aging model at my kitchen table. <laughs> And we started with a single pair of socks um, made from recycled soda pop bottles. I was actually offered to model those socks. And Did they, you do it? Well, not the way they wanted. They weren't even sure. It was a really small budget. Okay. But it was a time when not a lot of job offers were coming my way. And they weren't even sure they weren't going to use my face. Like maybe they just you cut know, you at the knee. Yeah. But I like the people. So John and Marilyn Moretz out of North Carolina, they're still in business with us today. Wow. And, you know, when you find great people, you hang on to them. I, I just said, you know what? I, I like your socks. I had saved my money to put a team together. When I modeled, people would tease me and say, you're so cheap. Why don't you 
have nicer clothes or drive a better car. I was fiscally frugal and investing in a team. So people who had, I love sports. And so when you have different people with different gifts and strengths, marketing, creative, um, you know, vision and strategy, all coming together towards the same goal. And I thought if we could take this basic pair of socks and bring beauty and fashion and innovation, like that would tell us if we had a real brand. Wow. So I said, not, not just a model, but I want to partner with you. So that's what we did. And did they say yes right away? Mm, not like right, right away. But <laughs> once we got to know each other and right. talk about it, it was, it was fairly, fairly short time afterwards. Do you feel like it was harder going into meetings like that as a recognizable model? Like, do you feel like it played against you or for you? I think that the wrong doors are open when you're known for a background like modeling. Doors of curiosity can be open, right. but usually those are doors that just waste each other's time. Right. Quite often my ideas as CEO, I believe are not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that you have to fight through. And so what I share with women is if you have the gift of anonymity, that's awesome because mm. you have a clean slate nobody has a preconceived notion of you and you can build your brand however mm. you want it that's great who was giving you advice when you were building your company i had great parents i mean your my mom parents and dad. were helping you? well just lessons that i would learn so when i had my paper out my dad would say kathy give 110 percent if mm. the customer expects the paper on the driveway you put it on the front porch so that was my foundation of learning to under-promise and over-deliver. And okay. it's truly the foundation of our business. Like if one of our team members does like a great presentation, they're like, I got it on the front porch, you know? So that's, that's so cute. Warren Buffett also had a paper route. And with oh, him, I didn't I, know that. He did. And Is he a mentor of yours at all? He's an amazing mentor. At his Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meetings, he starts it off many times with a newspaper tossing competition. So oh my gosh. he and Bill Gates and myself, we, we compete in this. He practices the night before like it's nobody's business. Uh. And he's got a few years on me. He's really good, <laughs> you know, more experience. But I, I really appreciate that he doesn't rest on his success. He just keeps practicing. But that, that was a great lesson. And then is. my mom was an amazing entrepreneur. I mean, oh, really? Avon lady, babysitting, housekeeping business. Then she became a nurse. Just always do it. So She I let you know could, that you could do it all. Yes. And I got to say, Ashley, you are an amazing mentor. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ashley, you are so inspirational for millions, including me. Oh. You, you, you teach and you inspire, and mm. that's really, it's really powerful. Well, that's really so, nice of you. It's, it's the truth. It's the truth. She's my mentor, I'm and I'm her mentor. mentor. <laughs> Do a lot of women come to you and ask you for advice on like how to have a voice in a room filled with men? Yes. And what is your advice? To speak out. There was a Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. Lean In. I love that. And yet when we started, I mean, there was no table to lean into. We literally built the table, marketed it, sold it, right? <laughs> built our own boardroom. So if you don't have a boardroom to lean into, start one, build one. So take control, take, take own control. agency of right. where you are. And I think women in particular, something that makes me sad is I see women selling their businesses. Why do you quickly. think they're doing that? I don't know exactly. I, I have seen some positive changes in the years and decades that I've been working in business. Interesting. But it's, um, it, you lose control. I think there can be pressure because it's, it's hard. But when you own your name, it's powerful. Yeah. And th there's reasons that sometimes people sell. But I just, I, I love it when I see women hanging on and just battling through those tough times. Oh my gosh, I love this conversation, but just give me two seconds. If you know me, you know I'm all about self-care. So since I'm at home in Nebraska, one of my new favorite self-care practices is all about scents and making the house smell so good. And Vitruvia is an amazing family company that makes these diffusers and these really cool oils that I have right here. And they have tons of different scents. I'm currently using Quiet. Hello. It reminds me just to take a deep breath and chill out. They even have these really cool mist rollers that are great for on the go. You can put them on your 
temples, your wrists. Head to vitruvi.com slash pretty big deal for a special offer and get 20% off with the code PBD. Okay, back to this pretty big deal. It's like the obvious thing to kind of go into swimsuits and sell those, but you decided to go outside of the box. And what encouraged you to do the complete unexpected thing with socks? I mean, honestly, it was because that was what was offered to me to model. Okay. So, <laughs> I, but at the same time, it was at a time in my life where I really wanted to close the door on modeling because I didn't know if I didn't do that, if I would ever live my dream of design and business. Mm. It was all about people, good people. It's like, okay, here, these great people have come my way. I really liked them. It's really about liking and people. That's what you've said that before. Like you only want to work with people you like. With good people, with integrity. And sometimes people are, people can be deceptive. Mm. They're, you know, sadly not always who they say they are. Yeah. And we've all been hurt by that. But when you find good people, you hang on to them. And, and we started the process. We started surprise factory inspections. You learn a lot when you show mm. up unexpectedly. Interesting. And it's something that we continue today. It's almost like auditing the factories, right? Right. That's what it well, probably feels like. Well, what I was sharing with you earlier about um, Fashion Jungle, the book. Yes. Tragically, I mean, human trafficking, it's a fastest growing illegal business on earth. And unlike drugs, human beings can be sold over and over and over. Ugh. And when I was working in the modeling industry in the 80s, I'd show up at my hotel in Milan and there'd be a guy there. And they would refer to them as playboys. And I mean, they're predators. And so I remember this guy was saying, he knew my name and I was so surprised. I was a teenager and I was so surprised he knew my name. And he said, you come with me to the villa. And I was like, the villa, I'm supposed to stay at this hotel. He's like, no, 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 come with me to the villa. I have a beautiful villa. And what I found, and I, and I you know, got rid of him. But what I found out from other girls is that some of people involved in the agency, they would have deals with these guys and they'd get you to the villa. Their napkin ring would be a, a diamond, an emerald. They would seduce these girls, get them hooked on drugs, and start selling them into the sex slave trade. You're kidding and me. And tragically, when human beings are no longer profitable and sex slave, they're often sold into forced labor. So working in manufacturing of any kind of products, like how things come to market, is so critically important. And actually, this is something that you're really passionate about. This is one of the charities that you give back to. And something that I think is incredible about your work ethic is that you only want to work with businesses that are going to give back to charities in some capacity. What made you want to have that be something that was a non-negotiable in going into business with people? It's really easy to get overwhelmed. You know, just when you see things going on in the world. You look at what's going on in Myanmar with the Rohingya people, or in Xinjiang, China with the Uyghur people, the girls in Nigeria, and it can just be heartbreaking and overwhelming. And then the poverty and lack of education and just disease and so many things. In maturity, I've learned to recognize it's a blessing to be exposed to needs that are bigger than me and to mm. opportunities that are bigger than me. Mm. And I love our team. Most of us have been together 30 years. That's so wild and to me. You know, we've got our millennial team and our Gen Z team, uh, but it, it's awesome. It's a great team. And so I, I've worked with the UN on their youth program, their Millennium Development Goals. We've added a couple more supporting our military and fighting human trafficking. Wow. And I was with the UN a couple of weeks ago for um, international religious freedom and just seeing what's going on around mm -hmm. the world and how do we as business people address that? Mm. How do we make an impact mm. and make a change and have some leverage there? It's the first part of our vetting process. When we're considering working with a new partner, we show them our list and we don't dictate a, a monetary amount, but they've got to get involved some way. Maybe it's volunteer time. That's and great. that inspires me to keep going yeah. because there's days, I mean, we all have them when we're tired and this and that, but it's like, no, we're just getting started. I mean, I feel <laughs> like our brand is celebrating its 26th year and I feel like we're a baby brand just getting started. 26 years. There's so much to do. Wait, and you said so 26 years, baby brand, but you have 15,000 products worldwide. Correct? Yep. For the audience, can you tell us some of those like really just like off the cuff things that you're selling the, that maybe we would be surprised about? Well, it's everything from 
diamonds to fashion apparel, just got back from the high point furniture market, home furnishings, and it's also areas of fintech. It's education, it's publishing, entertainment, wow. um, education Power is a drills. passion. Blinds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working in, in areas of insurance and insurance. just areas that are bringing solutions. So our brand, it's, it's really all about solutions. How do you do it all? How do you stay balanced? I mean, I've been talking a lot about the word balance mm -hmm. and how it's kind of this word that a lot of people don't believe in because if you're a mother and a businesswoman and a wife and you also need to have self-care for, for your own well-being, right. how do you handle all of it? Some days not well. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, I, I really believe women can have it all, but not all at once. I really mm -hmm. believe our life comes in seasons mm -hmm. and that every season... We need to prioritize our time. What I share with, with people when they ask me that question is figure out what your values are, what's most important. And for me, it's my faith, and then it's my family, and then it's being in service through the work. And the minute I don't honor that, I'm a disaster. I really? mean, my coping skills are out the window. I'm not effective at anything. What is advice that you give to new moms walking into this? I feel like I'm so blind walking into mm. what's to come. It is so exciting. And I would say when you have those nights when you're not sleeping, I never figured it out with all three of our kids. I never <laughs> figured out the sleeping through the night thing. And they, they eventually do. It gets easier and it gets better. And as they get older, I mean, it's so wonderful to have their personalities come through. I mean, for me, it's prayer. That's, mm. uh, that's the biggest, biggest, it's powerful. And no matter how old your kids are, you mm. never stop being a mom. And so from the littlest, littlest, you know, when you just need help, yeah, um, that's powerful. It's very similar advice that my mom has given me. Just like, you have to pray through all of it. Yeah. How do you keep your faith integrated into who you are every day? Because that to me is very inspiring. You know, just being, you are a believer, I'm a believer. And, and mm. I really look up to you for that as well. Oh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm just so grateful that God is so gracious and patient with me. I'm such a slow learner. Aww. And I, I actually came to know him. I grew up with no faith, but my mom um, had become a Christian when she was at nursing school. She oh, was wow. working, there was this woman there and my mom's like, wait a minute, you have three teenage daughters. I have three teenage daughters, but you have this peace. Like, what is it? I want what you have. And the woman said, it's Jesus. And my mom was quiet about her faith, but I was noticing this change in her. I was noticing this strength, this beautiful strength that I, I really admired. And then I'm off in Paris, I'm 18 years old, and I was staying in a home where I didn't feel comfortable and it was a lonely time mm. and it wasn't a good time. And without telling me, she stuck a Bible in my suitcase. And 1981, no cell phones, there was like nothing to distract me. I had just barely finished high school and I swear I was never gonna read another book. Uh, not that I had read that many, but I just <laughs> and, and without telling me, mom, she packs a Bible in my suitcase. I'd never read one in my life. And it's the middle of the night and I open up and I'm reading the book of Matthew. And as I was reading, I knew that what I was holding was the truth. Wow. And there was nobody in that room with me. Nobody was saying, be a, you know, this faith or be that faith or this religion or that religion. Right. I just said, I want to follow him. Wow. And I think being a young woman in a world that felt dominated by a lot of men of questionable character, that was the world I was in. I saw Jesus disrupting and loving women mm. and honoring them. And so I just figured if he's with me, who can be against me? That gave me the courage to punch the guy. Not that, you know, I can't blame I that it. on Jesus, but that gave me, it's like, no. if I don't work it, it's okay. I'll do yeah. something else. It's going to be okay. And then I have to admit, I, the very thing that led me to him, um, his word, I neglected. Mm. So I'd read and I'd be like, ooh, I like that. And then I'd read other things. I'd be like, oh, that's a typo. Or <laughs> that, it doesn't pertain to me. That's something else. Uh -huh. And so I was molding God into what I wanted him to be rather yeah. than surrendering mm. and letting him mold me into the person he made me to be. Mm. And I'm so grateful. He's so, so patient with me. I was 44 
before I, I read the entire Bible. Taken out of context, it can be oh, dangerous. People use incredibly. it for agendas. When you read it in its entirety, I mean, I just love in Revelation, it says the throne of God is made up of every tongue, tribe, and nation, and there is no room for racism, hatred, bullying of any kind, and it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and it's truth, but I just remember feeling like I just didn't have the time. I felt convicted in my heart. Just felt the Lord letting me know that he's like, you say I'm your first priority, but I'm make not. Me. Make me your first priority. And I was yeah. like, but, but you know my kids and the ages and the, and the work and the husband, everything, you know. And I felt him convict my heart. Put me first and I will give you more time and I will give you better time. And so he is so faithful in that. I started by setting my alarm clock 15 minutes early. And it, soon it became like an hour, and I just look forward to it. Wow. And so for the question you asked yeah. me about mothering advice, yeah. when I don't do that, I'm usually apologizing to somebody <laughs> by like 7 or 8 in the morning because something's come out of my mouth that just wasn't good. That's great. It helps me with our kids. Um, I mean, just when That's they're— That's like you said. Like you prioritize your right. faith, your family, and then everything else comes after business, da-da-da-da-da, yeah. and it makes sense. Thank works. you for being so open oh, and honest and just, you're so welcoming. And uh, there's one thing that we do okay. on Pretty Big Deal is you just have to answer a little Live Boldly lightning round questions. All right. They should be easy, hopefully. Okay. Dun, right. dun, 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 dun. Right. <laughs> okay, what's the last pretty penny you spent? My husband and I just had our 31st anniversary and we got each other electric bikes and they're so fun. Oh, cool. I know. First of all, 31 years married? Yeah. <gasps> I know. I know. That's, wow. That's a, the key to that is the mothering one, too. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's, okay. Yeah. What's the biggest deal breaker for you? When someone is deceptive, mm -hmm. uh, when they're not honest. I'm, just, I'm really direct and transparent. Yes. And I expect other people to be, and they're not always. And so... Yeah. That's a big deal you breaker. Get through it, but that's a deal breaker. Yeah. So I only have pretty big deals on my show, mm -hmm. um, but I want to know what is a pretty big deal to you since you're a pretty big deal? Oh, thank <laughs> you. You know what's a pretty big deal to me? Ashley, you are a pretty big deal. Oh my gosh. You are a really pretty big deal. Thank you. You bring so much inspiration and um, encouragement <laughs> <laughs> to people around the world. I'm at the top of that list. Aww. So you are, I'm so proud of, when Thank I first you. learned about you, I was so excited. I'm like, oh, she's killing it. Look at this beautiful woman and just soaring and achieving your dreams wow. and Thank in you. such a beautiful way. You Thank have you. a wonderful way. So congratulations. Thank you. A lot of brilliance there and Thank hard you. work yes. for what you're doing a lot. We're doing this together, girl. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kathy Ireland, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Kathy, for being oh, here. I really you. appreciate everything. And everybody at home, thank you so much for watching this episode of Pretty Big Deal with Kathy Ireland. Don't forget to join the conversation on social. Follow us, Pretty Big Deal, on Instagram and Twitter, and send us all your questions and comments. We want to hear from you.